Welcome to church. This is going to be such a wonderful day. God's here, you're here. Preaching from Ephesians chapter 4 today. You ready to worship? Yes. Yes. Come on inside. Come on inside if you're outside. Let's stand, let's worship, let's sing, let's praise our awesome God. Come on.
Look how far the Lord has brought me. Look at all the things he's done. A million different miracles. I could never list out every one. His kindness. His kindness led to my repentance. His mercy washed my sin away. He filled me with his promises. Rescued me from all my empty ways. The singer, I have hope. and generations falling down and worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation Holy, 
Jesus, Jesus. Let's close our eyes and let's lift our hands to God. As an act of surrender, to say, God, do what you want this morning in our lives. You are holy and we come into this holy place right now, this, this place away from the world. You say, come away with me a place separate and protected for us. God, we, we enter into your holy space today. God, we find peace. We find freedom. We find joy in your presence. We find healing. In the name of Jesus, if anyone is lacking, let them be filled with your presence in Jesus' name. Do wonderful things in our presence this morning in Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. I, I've been so captivated recently by the prayers of Paul in the Ephesian church, to the Ephesian church. And uh, like Ephesians 3, 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or imagine, according to his great power that's a work within us, to him be the glory in the church for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. But I, I realized this week that when I'm by myself, 
I, I lower my expectations of what God will do down to my own experience. But when we get together, we, ri- we raise our expectations up to the level of our shared experience. But Paul says, don't stop there. Don't just stop at the shared experience, the shared testimonies that we share, the, the, the miracles that we know of. Don't just stop there. Raise it up to another level. Raise it up, raise it up even further than C3 Australia. Raise it up even further than every Christian that's alive right now. Raise it up even further to every Christian that has ever been alive ever and their experiences. And then God can do immeasurably more than all we, the shared body of Christ, can ever ask or imagine. To Him be the glory in the church forever and ever. Amen. Give God some praise. Come on. Let's, let's use it to wake up our faith this morning. Let's activate that kind of faith in prayer. And so some of you have got some pretty big things that are going on in your worlds, and we need God's intervention. We need God's freedom. We need God's power. Who knows that someone has, has been healed from the disease that you're facing before? Who knows that some of you have got some relationship issues, but God has solved that before. So let's pray again. Let's pray in great faith. Let's say, If God can do it in them, He can do it in me as well. If God can do it in that time, He can do it now as well. Let's pray for these things on our hearts this morning. Let's pray in great faith. Let's lift a roar of faith to God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you. Do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, Lord God. God, we pray again in great faith for healing to enter bodies, for salvation to enter households. God, thank you. We are praying, Lord Jesus, that our workplaces would be places that know the love of God. We pray that our homes will be full of the presence and peace of God. God, we pray for freedom in relationships in Jesus' name. My God, we pray for us as we partner with Him in the mission of God, that we would see people come to know Christ on a weekly basis in Jesus' name. My God, bless these wonderful people. God, give God some praise. Put your hands together. What God is doing in our worlds. Ah, God is good. God is so good to us. Hey, have a seat, everybody. We had a fantastic week at C3 Australia conference. It was so good. Hey, but first of all, let's actually welcome anyone who's here. Uh, if you're new or if you're, you haven't been around for a while, I'd love to welcome you to church. This is a pretty friendly bunch, but we want to become friends. So welcome to church. Hope you hang around afterwards and, uh, and get to know some of these amazing people. Can we put our hands together for all the new people today? If you're joining online as well, thank you so much for joining us. Please reach out. Say hi in the chat or send us an email at hello at c3rabina.org.au if you're checking us out for the first time today. We'd love to get to know you. So make sure you get in touch so you can get to know you and you can get to know us and what we're all about. Kids, hey, kids, I think it's time for kids to go to kids' church. Could you put your hands together for some of the most wonderful people in the world? Have a great time. This has been a big week for Kids Church for our kids. Because the, kids the C3 Australia Conference, they had a dedicated kids program for all the pastors' kids and leaders' kids uh, and all the team kids. It was amazing. So, so good for our, our kids to have, um, to build some relationships. These are, I was saying to some people this week, they're the same age that I think we started going to some of these kind of things. Like the first time that we visited C, uh, Christian City Church Brookvale, which is now... C3 SYD, and I think I was eight, and about, yeah, so about Xander Gabby's age, and I just remember how, how awesome it was to go to this big church and catch vision. We could see the band on stage, we could see the crowd of people, and that sowed seeds of vision for me now, and so thank you so much for taking me and not just giving us to babysitters for the week, but we went to 
We went to conferences upon conferences upon conferences, made great friends, and it just helps so much to catch the culture of the nation and uh, the culture, the culture of uh, C3 around the world. Uh, hey, hey, this is really cool. This is exciting. So um, Lars Halverson, Lars and Megan are our C3 Australia overseers. Please pray for them as they lead. They're doing a brilliant job leading C3 Darwin and C3 Australia as well now. And uh, they announced the C3 Australia vision. How, get a load of this, this is amazing. A life-giving church within reach of every Australian. Who wants, who wants to be a part of that? Who's so happy we're a part of C3? So good. Hey, so great news. Next year, we don't have a C3 Australia conference. We have a C3 global conference. We would love to take as many people as we can. We'd love to love you to start saving your pennies and uh, put, some, put some aside for a bit of a travel kitty because we're all going to Singapore. Four of us are going to Singapore. <laughs> Come on. C3, C3 Global Conference is going to be in Singapore next year. Um, so TBC, because it just needs to final conf- confirmation, but we're 90% sure that it's going to be in Singapore next year. And it is going to be amazing to be with uh, the movement from around the world, the 400 plus churches that we're at now and, uh, and the thousands upon thousands of people worshiping Jesus together. Who's keen for that? Yeah, it's good. I'm keen for this. I want to see a life-giving church within reach of every Australian. Um, my heart is salt. So very good. Well, hey, what, one thing we're going to do right now is, uh, is take communion together. We're going to, this is one of the precious times that we had at our pastor's day. We had a dedicated pastor's day for C3 conference. And so all the pastors got to sit around tables and to share in communion together. So we're going to take some time to, today to open up to 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. And verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a a powerful, transformative moment where we don't just remember that Jesus died, but we remember that Jesus died in our place taking the sins that we had done, taking our fallen nature in himself, dying a death that we should have died, but then conquering death, coming back to life. And the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now lives in us and strengthens our mortal bodies. This is a, this is a moment of power. It's a, it's a moment of new starts. It's a moment of perfect forgiveness. It's a moment of a clean slate. But it's also a moment of empowerment. It's a moment of healing. And it's a moment of of accepting God's transformative power in our lives that causes us to be new. And so as we take the bread and the juice this morning, we remember God. And may God bless you and fill you with his power in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. My God, as we take the bread today, Lord, we identify in your sufferings. We see your body broken for us. And we are so thankful. Take the bread in remembrance of him. Go for it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. 
as you take the cup today, let me proclaim to you that you are completely forgiven. The blood of Christ, the life of Jesus fills your body, strengthens and sustains you in Jesus' name. Be blessed as you drink. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My God, you are good. You are so very good. Holy Jesus. Holy Jesus. Just got a sense that we're going to pause here for a little bit. Could we stand? Could we stand up in the presence of God? We're going to have a more extended worship and, uh, and altar call time at the end of the service after Diana preaches brilliantly on Ephesians 4. So excited. I just feel like the Holy Spirit wants to move a little bit here and to touch people's lives. And there's, I've, I've got this picture of, of the cross. We've come with this, this moment of communion. And there are some of you who are heavy laden and burdened. You're feeling burdened here today. Christ's word for you today is a, is a word of hope and a word of freedom. And he says, that burden was not yours to carry. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So if you're, if you're here today and you've got, a, you've got, it's like heaviness on your shoulders. I want to pray with you this morning. Can I pray with you? So you, if you're here, if you're just feeling the weight of the world is on your shoulders, why don't you come forward? And I want to pray with you in Jesus' name. Come forward. Thank you, Jesus. My God, my Jesus, come forward, be brave, be bold. Come forward and be free. Come forward and find freedom in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. And Hannah, could I pray for you as well? I think I've got a word for you. Can you be bold and come out here, Hannah? Thank you, Jesus. God bless Jace. My Jesus, freedom. This is not yours to carry, my son. I set you free. You are redeemed. You are new. All and healing in Jesus' name. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Church, why don't you lift your hands out to these people and pray for them? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. How good is God? Thank you, Jesus. So good. God is good. And he knows you and he loves you. All right. Well, church, let's have a seat as we prepare our hearts to give. And you may be giving during the week. You may be giving now. Regardless, I love this moment in our service where we can prepare our hearts and remember why we do it. This is, I'm so excited about today's preaching, Diana. I'm so excited that Diana Gray is preaching. Who's excited about that? <laughs> Great student of the word. And I, Diana is actually, I think, a unique personality to be able to really do a great job at this, pretty, as this chapter because it's a pivot chapter. It's exciting. I love this. It's like we've spent three weeks uh, looking at the grand scheme of God, the grand plan of God. The, he's used, Paul's used these, like, what seems like to us mere mortals is hyperbole, but we talked last week that it's probably actually dumbed down so we actually get it. These, these glorious, incomparably great riches of his grace and power and kindness expressed to us in Christ Jesus. Immeasurably more, all these words. And then Ephesians chapter 4 is now a pivot. It takes the grand plan and the scheme of life, of God, sorry, for life, and it, and it pivots and says, okay, because of all that, let's get practical. Let's get down to business. That's what today is. It's so exciting. But I, I love the pivot, the pivot sentence at the start of Ephesians chapter 4. This is our heart for our giving today. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. To live a life worthy of the calling you've received. This, this is the gospel right here. This is the unique thing about why, what we believe in Jesus. It, notice very clearly, it doesn't say to live a life worthy so that you can be called. Or to live a life that's good enough so that God would love you. He says, live a life worthy of the calling that you've already received. God has already lavished upon your life mercy and kindness and glorious riches of His inheritance in the saints. He's already filled you with power. He has already gifted you with the Holy Spirit. He's already set you apart from the beginning of time to be joined with Him. He's already died for you and rose again for you. He has already knitted you into the body of Christ. He has already brought you out of darkness into light. He has already provided your every need. He has already given you friends and family who, can, who believe in Christ and who can lead you further in Him. He's already done this. This is the calling of God. And He's already given you partnership in the gospel. He's given you so much. And so in this and the rest of the chapters, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, what we're going to find is what it looks like to live a life worthy of that call. What is, if, if we were the moon reflecting the sunbeams of the sun, what would it be like? If, how, what, would it look, what, what was the, the, the appropriate response to God's unlimited favor and grace? And that's the heart of why we give, and that's the heart of why we serve, and that's the heart of why we want to reach out to our friends and share the gospel with them, is because God has poured out so generously all the good news and all the goodness into our lives. So how can we help but not want to give generously to Him, right? That's the heart that we give. So let's live a life worthy of the calling we've received. If you've, if you've been called by God, then let's live a life worthy of that. Let's see if we can match His generosity today. Let's see if we can match His obedience. Let's see if we can match His faithfulness. Let's see if we can match His love in Jesus' name. No, we won't be able to. But you know, we're going to give a good try. 
Let's pray as we give today. Thank you, Lord. My God. Lavished is a good word. You lavished upon us with all wisdom, such love. You laid down, you laid down your life for us. You planned us. You prepared a wonderful life for us. And God, you've prepared an eternity for us as well. And so God, we give to you today with that heart that says, God, we're going to respond in kind in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you bless every giver today. God, you bless everyone here with your goodness, with your provision, with increase. God, so they can do good on every occasion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you as you give. You can give online and you can give at the back at the kiosk after the service. That's good. All right. Well, hey, let me tell you a few things that are coming up. We have Vision Builders coming up. Vision Builders is, uh, is only, uh, I don't know, let's say, let's say six or seven weeks away, Heather. That's it. At the end of June, and we are so excited by this dinner. So that's a, it's a dinner for all of our church to attend. And so we would love to, let, we'd love to um, know whether or not you're coming. So we're going to be sending out RSVP links this week so that you can register and so we can make sure that we have enough food for everybody. It is going to be such fun. It's good. Hey, uh, I love it. Quick, quick update. Actually, Jace, could you come and tell us a bit about what happened at youth on Friday night? Amazing things happening at youth. And while you do, while you come up, we have prayer meeting. Keep walking. We have prayer meeting coming up on the 16th of this month. So not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. So uh, bring your connect group. Bring your families along. Jace, what happened at youth? Tell me. Lots. Lots. That's the short version of lots. <laughs> no, we had, I think we had about 15 kids. And we had, um, I think it was five except Jesus as well. Um, <laughs> We had, um, we had a guest preacher on Friday night. He was a good-looking rooster. Um, so I spoke out of John 15. So we're talking about the belong part of the belong, grow and go. So I wanted the kids to know that they belong here and this is their home and to be connected. Or to grow, they have to be connected and to get their roots down. So we wanted them to know, that, you know to get their roots down and to set like a, a good foundation for the next generation. Yeah. And so I had the, one of our crew, I think Noah, I got the prayer of Noah, yeah. and uh, just so he felt that his roots were connected. So it was such a privilege and an honor. And, and youth, is, the ground that's already been established, the roots that are already here yeah. from the past, yeah. from everyone's been beforehand and set that foundation, we now want the kids to get their roots in and intertwine with that stuff. Yeah. And it was really cool praying with Noah because as I prayed with him, I could see his roots. God showed me his roots going into the ground and starting to intertwine. So I hope Noah doesn't mind me sharing that, but it, yeah. So they actually um, got to prophesy with the kids. And as that was happening, they started to prophesy for each other. So youth is flourishing. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Hannah, you're flourishing. <laughs> um, Ashley, you're flourishing. The kids are just flourishing. So if you want to come along and check it out, Come and hang with us. We'd love to have you along. So. Oh, thanks so much for sharing, dude. That's awesome. So precious. I love our youth and our kids team, young adults. We've got a new young adults connect group kicked off, which is so exciting. Good days ahead, church. So, so very good. Hey, let's stand up to our feet. Let's prepare our hearts to receive the word of God this morning. Diana's going to be up next. Thanks so much, man.
temptation but deliver us from evil like you do lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom the power the glory Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Let's open our hearts to receive God's word and say amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, band. Awesome. You may be seated, guys. Thank you. Give a big, big round of applause to our band. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, we're going to talk about Ephesians 4, and we're going to go into God's Word, and I believe, and as Pastor Josh said, God's going to do some great things in our hearts today. So this is going to be a very special time this morning. As we know about Ephesians, Ephesians is a letter. 
So the verses were added on later as the Bible was formed and grouped. The content is infallible and unchanged, but it's just the structure. So the Ephesians was a letter. Paul wrote a letter. And when we read a letter, who knows what the letter consists of when we write? We have some writers here. We have introduction. We have the body. And we have the conclusion. Is that right? Is that how we structure our text? Great. So Paul probably did the same. Ephesians 4 is perhaps the body of the letter. So when we are reading a letter out of context, it is going to present some challenges if we don't look at the introduction and if we don't look at the conclusion. So if we're going to do a little recap of Ephesians 1 to Ephesians 3, it talks about God, His grace, His gift, and everything He's done for us how he has redeemed us, how we were annihilated and ostracized, that's a very strong one, from the society of Israel. Because back in the day, Israel was the nation and were the people who were known to have access to God exclusively. So that heavy word excluded from the society of Israel means annihilated from God and from the, anything that had to do with God. So that's what Ephesians for talks about how one who was annihilated, one who was removed is now accepted. And it is impossible to read that without laying that context first and just reviewing it a little bit. Also, because it is a prison epistle, it was written in prison. So Paul thought how paramount and how significant and how important it was for him to preserve this message. How hold on to this message, unlike any other messages. So Colossians, for example, was written in a response to a strife in the church. It was written in response to addressing the issue of false doctrine in the church. Ephesians and Colossians is known to be written in parallel potentially because of the similar context and give away a little bit toward the end, mentions a person called Tychicus. We will see that in Ephesians 6. So most likely that epistle was written in response, unlike the Ephesians. That was not written in response to any controversy. It was written from prison, which means Paul being in prison, not prompted by any external circumstance to write that, saw that message as paramount, which means God saw this message as paramount for us. So it will be big negligence for us to not look into it a bit deeper. We're going to read Ephesians 4. We're going to follow the same, I guess, tradition, for lack of a better term, that we're going to read the whole chapter. So let's all read it together, open our hearts, and then we're going to break it into a little bit. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. Feel free to read out of any version that you have available. But let's read together. Ephesians 4. Can we please have thank you? So I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Just pause really quickly. The concept of captivity, bondage, Christ has done away with. He captivated it. Resume. Thank you. And gave gifts unto men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but by trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in the true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Wow, that's amazing. Good and big. We probably could have a year of study on this, but we're going to just focus on one thing today that we believe is paramount for every one of us. I want to go back into a little bit why specifically Ephesians. I have a personal testimony with this book and just generally with the epistles. I had a point in my life when I read the Bible from cover to cover and I kept reading every so often and then I hit a point where I just felt like I hit a dead end. I didn't know how to read the Bible anymore. And I'm not really good with Bible plans. So you know how you have these, a new version, read, I don't know, Timothy in two weeks, focus on love or whatever. That doesn't work for me. That's not the way how I function. I don't read the Bible like that. I can read it for a purpose, but this is not my ordinary reading. And I asked the Spirit of God. I said, God, what would you like me to read and how do you want me to, what should I read next? And I heard really clearly the Spirit of God said, well, the epistles are written to the church, you are the church, so they're for you. Read Ephesians. And when I opened Ephesians, and I think it's a very important thought here, when we feel like we hit rock bottom in reading our Bible, it's important to ask God to guide us. Because the Bible, the Word of God, is only the Word of God if it points us to Jesus. Jesus said, remember on the road to Emmaus, as he was walking with the two dudes after he rose from the dead, they didn't recognize him, and they were talking about the things, and he was quoting from Moses to the prophets, in other words, from Genesis, because it was written by Moses, and all the way back to the current time, and how all the scriptures testified of him. And he also says in another place that you believe to have eternal life from the scriptures, but the scriptures testify of me. The whole point of the Bible is to point us to Christ. He is a roadmap. So without Christ, the Bible becomes empty. And I don't, can't say that that necessarily happened to me to this extent, but I was just reading and reading and I lost it. What is it for me? And then God said, go to Ephesians, go to the epistles, therefore the church. And I encourage you, if you feel like that as well, where you don't know how to read your Bible and you don't feel necessarily, necessarily that the Bible plan is something that works for you, 
you ask the Holy Spirit, what should I do? How should I read? What should I say? And he will prompt you. He might prompt you to a Bible plan, but he might give you something personally. It could be for a season. It could be for time being. It could be for a one-off. So I went to Ephesians. And when you read to the church, you realize that you're reading a lot of rules, especially if you start in Ephesians 4 or 5, do this, don't do this, be angry, forgive. And then it almost can make you judgmental because then you read, don't be like those guys who are pretty wicked and evil. They're lost, but you're amazing. You're holy. You're set apart. And you read, oh, wow, I'm good. And it, it can totally set you off and put you on the wrong, wrong track and elevate you above others if you do not put everything in context. God's heart was to give us some context. Because without his context, all of us are pretty much just a bunch of filthy people inside. And we might look nice on the outside, but we've got a lot of baggage that we carry and that we give to the Lord progressively over the course of our life. And I feel that when I looked at Ephesians, I looked at all these previous chapters, one, two, three. I'm not going to go back to them. The guys have done an amazing job talking about them. But it talks about what it means to be in Christ. One specific verse, it talks about that you have been saved through faith. What does that mean? It means that faith is an expression or a logical conclusion of your hope. We hope in Christ and then we go. It births faith. And it's not of our own. It says that, that it's not of our own. It's a gift of God. Let any man boast. When we have that faith that saves us, that grafts us into Christ, we realize that it's faith in what he's already accomplished. It's faith in his identity. It is faith. When you read put on Christ, put on this, that, it doesn't make much sense until it becomes live. I want to share about, I don't know, six years ago during worship, I just had a very clear picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. He wasn't hanging and looking like the Hollywood Jesus. It was gross. He was naked. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was absolutely distorted. It certainly would not have been a children's Jesus movie. And I am sitting there and I see him on the cross and at the same time, I see me on that cross. I see it as I who is hanging on that cross. And it was almost frightening because it was very vivid. And then the next thing, I'm taken to a moment when Jesus is buried. And now I see myself buried. And then I see Jesus rising from the dead in glorious, glorious white garments with gold on the sides, just beautiful. And then I see it is me who rises. And then I'm taken to my baptism experience, how I'm getting out of that water. And I see how that natural act had a tremendous spiritual impact on me. And all of a sudden, I just had that download revelation, rhema, that is personal to me, that what it means to put on Christ, what it means to be buried with him into his death, that it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And it is no longer you who live, but Christ lives in you. So when we understand that meaning, only through this lens, it is possible to follow anything that is mentioned in Ephesians 4. So with that in mind, when we put on Christ and understanding that it's he who redeemed us, and then it's a partnership. We do have free will. We do have that ability to willingly choose to put him on. So I like to see it as a house. If you have a, I don't know, a rock, a brick house. If you go inside, someone from the outside doesn't see you anymore. They just see the house. So this is how the Father sees us. When he looks at you, if you are inside that house, you, he no longer sees you. He just sees the house. So Jesus is that house. He says, he who builds a house on a rock. We are inside the house. So he in us enables us to do all these things. And therefore, because of the way he's positioned us, because of the authority that he's given us and the power of the Holy Spirit, that's why he's asking of us all these things. If you notice, God will never ask anything of us that firstly, he hasn't demonstrated himself. And secondly, he doesn't think we're capable of doing. God will never, ever any, ask you to do anything if you, that he hasn't done himself. Every single thing that is written here, Jesus has been tempted in, had, has had the opportunity to not do or not follow. It says that he's been tempted in all things but sin, which means he has not sinned. He hasn't given in to any of these things. Every single area that he's asking us to do, he's done it. He would not ever ask you to do anything he hasn't done. And the same thing, it's so important. 
he will not ask you to do anything if he doesn't think you're capable of it. If he doesn't think you have the help on. On your, on your own, you're not, let's be honest, and I'm not. But we have the help on. So he's only asking us because you know there's a way for it. So with this in mind, if we look at the way he structures Ephesians 4 itself, it's almost like the whole book of Ephesians is a letter and Ephesians 4 is the body. But even Ephesians 4 is like a letter in a letter. If you look at a structure in the beginning, he talks about that he's the prisoner of the Lord. He's specifically strengthening this point to you and to me. He says, it's important. I am in prison for this message. I am not prompted by any external circumstance to write this to you, but I still want to write this to you because despite of being in prison, I found this cause worthy. I found this cause worthy for you to know. He's talking about this. He's in prison. And that means Christ, yes, we have, we have free will. We can go back into the Garden of Eden and debate all this thing, how they had choice and free will. Yes, we do have free will, but also when we're walking in ministry, in service to God, God will lead us and say, I don't want you to go down this path. You have a choice. And remember, there was another moment in Scripture when Paul is going to Jerusalem and he's been consistently reminded by a prophet to say, oh, this belt is torn in, in half. And he say, this will happen to the man who goes to Jerusalem. And Paul knows it's him and he makes the choice. So God's clearly giving him a choice then. You don't have to go there, but he's choosing to. So God is obviously knowing that Paul is going to go through prison and he's letting Paul go through this message go through everything for the sake of that message because it's so important to God so we need to respond and it's so important to us he talks about how it is worthy of the calling then he talks about gentleness if you look at the way it's structured in the first couple of verses who is God the father who is above all through you all in all and he talks about unity God's idea of unity it is is more important for him than his idea of service to us. I would even probably go a bit far, maybe be a bit bold to say that maybe the only reason, it's no revelation, I'm just assuming. Could it be that the only reason why we even have service in the first place, together alongside each other, so that we learn to walk in unity, so that we learn to walk in love. God can create children out of stone he says, even if they shut up, the stones will cry out. Does God really need us? The majestic God who created the heavens and the earth, does he really need us? Could it be that these very gifts that he's describing above are the only reason? So that we learn to walk in unity. So that we learn to walk in love. Because when we do that, our character grows. Our relationship with him grows. We grow eternally internally and then we can bear fruit and help others to meet him in the end it's all about that I'm studying a master's in divinity in one of the probably the most prestigious theological seminaries in the world and I find that it's all about learning Jesus every single tool that you are getting and all this money you're paying is not about buffeting yourself or making yourself super high up and it's all about using every tool you can to spread this message to as many people as possible. This is the only thing that matters. And the more I go into studying this book, into studying all the other books and commentaries, you realize that the only thing that's really important is for as many people as possible to enter heaven, to populate heaven and to empty hell. That's the only important thing and that's why all these other tools screens all this if none of this was here today not much would have changed the message would have still been the same this is just tools all this is a tool apostles prophets mantras is it a tool for us to bring as many people to the kingdom of god but also to work on us because you are one of those people it's not just about you being used to do the work you are also valuable you are also the one for whom Christ suffered and who's worthy to be brought into the kingdom. So if you yourself in doing this work, like Paul says in Corinthians, I need to be careful lest doing this work, I myself remain unworthy because there's two parts to our Christian walk. Part one is our gifts, our callings. And the Bible says in 
other places that the gifts and the callings are irrevo irrevocable or without repentance. What does that mean? God doesn't change his mind. He's given you a gift and the gift stays with you. You don't take the gift back if you had an argument with someone. Theoretically, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> now, some might, but that's not the plan. It stays with you. And I feel like this is why a lot of people like, stumble. They see a minister or anyone doing amazing things, God doing undisputably God doing remarkable things by their hand but yet their personal character and their private life doesn't match the public ministry and it's and, it, and then they dismiss everything altogether but according to scripture that's not what it is it says that the kill, the gifts and the calling can be without repentance God will not take back the gift he gave you you can still operate in the gift but in private that character that he wants to shape in you and that relationship is, n is not not irrevocable. The relationship is something can, that can be lost. The gift cannot be. It's very, very sobering to think that. So here he's not only addressing the gift, but first he's addressing the relationship. The relationship of you and him, of me and him, and the relationship of each other. Because if we do not have that relationship with one another, if we're not walking in love, we do not have that ability to fully comprehend the richness and the purpose of that ministry. So once you lay this foundation, it's, it's foundational, it's in the very beginning. He starts bang, straight goes into it. He doesn't sort of go around it. So he says, he ascended unto heaven. He I specifically cho chose this version for that particular scripture. He led captivity captive. I checked in the Greek language to lead captivity captive. That means there's a concept of captivity the phenomenon of captivity. It's probably spiritual darkness, bondage, anything that leads the humankind to eternal damnation. It's captivity. Christ captivated the captivity. And in order to do that, it says, if you read the next verse, he went all the way down, verse nine. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended. So what does it mean? He goes down, uh, we, we saw that in the, other, in the Gospels, in the pits of hell. Three days, he is in the heart of the earth. Yeah. Or the, the grave, as what the scriptures tell us. He's there. He's doing away with death. He rises and overcomes that and ascends unto heaven. And he says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will give you the helper, the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things and he will guide you. This is what you gave gifts unto men. The Holy Spirit is the gift giver. He's the essence of the Godhead. Some people think that the Trinity, or God the Father, Son, and Spirit is divided. That God is the Father, is this amazing, powerful, angry being who wants to destroy humanity. And then Jesus stands in the gap and says, no, 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 please, please, don't, don't do this. I'm just going to redeem. I'm going to make things right. But that's not what the scriptures say to us. They're not only one in unity, they're one in mind. They have one mind. This is perhaps what unites the most. What's on the Father's mind is also on the Son's mind and it's on the Spirit's mind. It was the Father's idea to send redemption to humanity. They're of one mind. So he gives this Holy Spirit, who is the essence, the soul, the being, of the Godhead to be with us and to guide us personally first in our private life with him and then publicly in the display to others so that we can live a life worthy of the high calling that he talks about. It's the spirit living in us. But we also don't want to go to another extreme where you don't want to do anything. Oh, I don't need to do this. The spirit will do this for me. I don't need to be disciplined and study my own Bible. Oh, I don't need to uh, even bother coming to church. I don't need to, I don't know, even your private devotion. Oh, I'm not going to apologize to that person. I'm already forgiven. When we get to heaven, we'll be right. We'll smile at each other. So do you really believe if you're sitting next to someone in church and you're not talking to them and you have this, e in heaven all of a sudden, you're going to be, hey, nice to see you. I'm not sure it works like that. I feel like on earth, the song, on earth as it is in heaven, which is still us. Yes, we have a new body, a glorified body, but remember the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was still the rich man. He told Abraham, hey, can you send Lazarus, this guy? He still thought of Lazarus, that he's like this little servant dude. He didn't send Abraham. It's still him. 
still that same personality. So this is why, why we are on earth, it is so important to make every effort possible to be transformed into the character of Christ. And it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. The man on the cross died without baptism. He said, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I'm not talking about salvation by works, so I don't want that to be taken out of context. But what I'm talking about is those of us who are alive today and are blessed with an opportunity to grow in God. We should not you miss these opportunities. And if we do, we should not condemn ourselves because I have missed my opportunities many times. And I know I have. I just know myself of being self-aware, but also from God's revelation to me. And there's no condemnation. If you repent and just stand course, God will always give you another day. There's new mercy every morning. And if you keep going down from that, these scriptures, so 8, 9, 10, then he starts talking about the gifts. What does this mean to be that person who operates in the gifts? He gave some apostles. It's just a fancy word for messenger. It's a messenger of God who plants churches, lays their life down to the service of uh, the saints, of the people, and builds the kingdom by practical tools. Some prophets. Prophet is not necessarily, I would say, who prophesies. Everyone prophesies. Prophets prophesy, yes. But we all prophesy. We have the Spirit of the Lord. But a prophet is someone who brings the word of the Lord. On top of that, a specific anointing. There's someone who, what, what, what's next? So prophets, evangelists. We know evangelists. Expanding the kingdom. Going to places. Hey, have you met Jesus? Have you seen Jesus' revolution? This is, is the man who goes and says, have you seen Jesus? Do you know him? Then there's pastors and teachers. And they're grouped together because, yes, you have to be a teacher of the word. Some, are not, some teachers are not pastoral. Their specific calling is to go to teach. But you can't be a pastor without teaching. So it is all intertwined. All these gifts are intertwined. You can be a messenger without pastoring. You can be an apostle without pastoring. You can be an evangelist without teaching. So it's important to remember that all these gifts, everyone in the body of Christ falls under a category. This is probably like a general category because then he goes into specifics and he talks about what these gifts mean to us. He lists in the lower, further verses, how you should leave all malice, you should leave all evil, hate, and look what it says here, but speaking the truth in love, in verse 15, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that is Christ. So that's the point. If there was a punchline for Ephesians 4, it would be this, so that we all together grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, not just part of Christ. It doesn't say Christ's limb, so that we grow together to become Christ's liver or to become Christ's eye. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Even though independently, we are different members of his body. Some are liver, some are eyes, some are arm, you know. But it says together, we grow up to reach the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's crazy to think that here on this earth, we can come into this dimension where the fullness of Christ operates in our life. It's, I'm not there yet, but thank God I'm alive and believing for many, many more years and long, long life, and as are you all here. We're not there yet. No one can say that they've come to the fullness of Christ. I'd love to speak to you if you can say that, absolutely honestly. But if you're not, we're together. We're the household of faith. We're growing together. So I really, really encourage you to think about the message of unity and why is God so critically stressing this. We cannot grow into the fullness of Christ alone. I remember many years back, pre-Matthew, we house set for Pastor Don and Adrian, and that was my little retreat. I was just reading my Bible, enjoying myself, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm feeling so holy. I am just feeling so good. I'm so right with God. I just help. And then I came to church. Everything was great. The message was great. Worship was great. And then I got on the cafe. Youth are on coffee that day, and they're taking their time making my coffee. And on the inside, I'm starting to boil. And I'm thinking, mm, why is this taking so long? It's just one cup of coffee. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. 
you should be rejoicing that these young people chose to get up early on a Sunday morning and do coffees for the body of Christ rather than sleeping after having a hangover after a late Saturday night. And you're whinging that you're waiting for extra 10 minutes for your coffee. It was, and I'm thinking, this is the fruit. The fruit is not when you're in the anointing. Because the Bible says that even Saul prophesied with the prophets. And when he went onto that mountain, remember there was a whole bunch of prophets and Saul prophesied. And that's why they said even Saul prophesied because he wasn't a very nice king. He didn't end well. He started well, but he didn't end well. So when you are in the anointing, it's not hard to be holy. When you're excluded from people and a retreat and a changing of atmosphere, changing of scenery. But when you are waiting for your coffee and someone takes extra 10 minutes, what is inside of you that's rising? That's fruit. That's fruit. Not this. Being here is not fruit, but that's fruit. And when we grow and learn in the knowledge of Christ, He can use us. He can absolutely do mar marvelous, marvelous things with us. So He says, renew your mind. So this verse says, verse 17, I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. That puts on a whole different perspective, doesn't it? It takes away the judgment. It takes away that concept that I'm greater and better than them. But it says in the futility of their mind, it just shows that without Christ, our mind was futile. It means void, empty, immature, irrational, how many synonyms you can come up with. It just shows that without Christ, it's just vain. Everything is vain. So it says, put off your former conduct and the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So that tells us that without Christ, Christ's character in us and our partnership with him to be willing to operate in his character, this is all void. And I feel like we have so many people here today, including myself, where we have been given or entrusted a gift that Christ placed on us, but because of possibly either misconception, hurt, offense, just burdens of life, we feel like we're either unworthy or we've either put it on the back burner, but this is not what God wants for us. God was really strongly speaking to me this morning and last night that there are people here that God wants to heal their hearts, that God wants to deal with hurt, emotional hurt, not necessarily physical hurt. Physical, yes, if you feel the Lord is healing your body, there will be place for that after the service. We will come at the front, we'll pray. But also emotional. If you have gifts that God's placed on your life and He knows He's given you words of knowledge, words of prophecy, He's told you directly. When you read your Bible, all of a sudden you had this jump at you, you were burning, your heart was going like fast, you were pumping, you knew, oh my goodness, that's for me. Then you heard someone else confirm that to you by a word but you dismissed it because you either thought you weren't good enough or you either thought, can I have the band please as well? Thank you. You either thought that maybe I don't understand something. The Lord's going to deal with that tonight, that today. There's gifts on us that need to be activated that God wants to bring out to you because you're a blessing. You're a blessing to yourself. This will be a blessing to you first before it becomes a blessing to the church. It will be a blessing to you. Your life will be richer. You will be happier and you will give God that honor of worshiping him in the way that he will create it to worship him. This is very, very important. Very important. And is the prayers also are powerful. If you're a parent and your children are not at that, in that space, for example, you wish that that was for your children or you know your child has a gift on their life that was prophesied to them, but you know they're not walking in it. I want to encourage you today that God hears that. Yesterday, it was totally unsolicited, so to speak. I was preparing for this message. I am the digital technical person, but when things like that come, I like to be practical because technology can let you down, but this won't. I open my Bible and it says, Dear daughter, may God bless you. Love you, mom. 1999. I was preparing my first sermon with the Bible that my mom gave me in 1999, 24 years later. And I've had all sorts of things. I haven't always walked with the Lord. I've had a really rough time as a teenager and as a young adult. But the prayers of my family
has brought me through. And even more funny, this morning I said to Chris, can I borrow your Bible uh, just in case I don't want my app to glitch because I did this morning. And I open it and it says, dear son, Millie and Paul, 2014. It was my mom's Bible again to Chris. Other than my mom is our paper Bible supplier, but she was also praying for us and believing for us to live the life that is worthy of our calling. And perhaps you never had a mom or dad who prayed for you. Jesus said that I pray for them, Father, that in this world they will be spared from evil. Jesus prayed for you. Before he went back to the Father, before he took captivity captive, he prayed for you. 2,000 years plus ahead, he prayed for you. And because he prayed for you, you are here today. It's not a coincidence that you are here today. And you can be now that vessel who prays for your children, for your future generations. And I really, really encourage us to enter into some time when we just linger in this presence of the Lord, where we ask God two things. The first thing I want to ask him, do I really know the Lord? Do I really know him? Or am I perceived as though I know him? And I, I'm far too deep. I'm far in the thick of it. I've been in this too long. I can't come out now and ever be found out that I'm not really with the Lord. I'm embarrassed. But the Lord knows your heart. It's not about what I think, what anybody thinks. I want to, everyone to close their eyes and just ask themselves, do I really know him? Does he know me? When I stand before him in that last day, will I say to him, I prophesied in your name, or will he say, away from me, I never knew you? Or will he say, come into my joy? And also, if you know the Lord, if you know him, but you know you have a gift on your life, you know you were prophesied, you were told that there was a gift on your life, but life got in the way, disappointment got in the way, discouragement got in the way. I really want you to come out, to be prayed for that, so that the gift in your life may be established in you and activated and for you. Please come out. It is so important. And thirdly, if you need healing in your body, if you know there's something in your body that needs healing, please come out. As I finish this message, this, this is what we're going to do next. The Spirit of God wants to do something. If you don't know the Lord and you want to make Jesus your Savior, you want to make Him your God and your Master, come out. Don't be shy. Come out. Or at least speak to him between you and him. And if you have made that decision, if you did speak to him, talk to one of the pastoral team. Talk to Pastor Josh. Tell him about it in private or however you want to, but make sure you do. If you have a gift that you know you should be operating on, but you're not, come out, we'll pray. And if you know you need healing in your body, come out, please. Let's just sing that song one more time. And the angels cry. Thank you. It's a good time to come out now. Come out. The pastoral team will pray for you. Your name is the highest. Your name is the 
stands the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name is the highest your name it's the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation ministered to this morning come bring your burdens to the throne of grace and uh, we want to pray with you this morning if you need to head off please feel free to mother's day is next week bring your mum bring your kids we're gonna have a great celebration of mums uh pre- preaching in ephesians chapter 5 next week mal's gonna do that so looking forward to that it's gonna be a great week but god bless your church come forward for ministry if you need and just linger in the presence of god Thank you so much. Thank you, God. Hey, everyone. What a fantastic service that we have had today. If you have made a decision for Christ during the service, please reach out to us in the chat or hello at c3rabina.org.au. You can also send us through a prayer request at that same address. And um, we just pray that you have a fantastic week and God blesses you this week in Jesus' name.